This is Earth, 335 million years ago. I wasn't around then, but there's just one supercontinent, Pangaea. See? Let's watch it shift around and fast forward. Okay, here we go. It just split into two huge pieces. Australia goes this way, North and South America go that way. Africa, Asia, Europe, forming, forming, and there we go. The planet as it is today. Let's keep going. I mean, the continents are always on the move. Over time, some of them will crash into each other. Others will break apart. But that'll take about 100 million years. Better put it on super fast forward. 100 years from now, humans keep spitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and the planet's already warmed up a bunch. The world's ocean levels have risen about 4 feet. The Bahamas? They've totally disappeared. 200 years from now, the Earth's population is about 19 billion people. The climate's gotten even warmer. We're packed in like sardines over here. New medical tech makes it possible to live to 180. But why? Fossil fuel reserves of oil and gas? Long gone. Oh, and the continents have drifted over 16 feet. The Voyager 1 space probe's about to enter an asteroid cloud at the edge of the solar system. It's the most distant man-made object in the universe, I guess. A thousand years from now, thanks to better quality food, humans are now 7 feet tall on average. Technology solved the pollution and fuel shortage problem. Humanity's doing just fine. Robots do all the work, we just play around all day. Ocean levels have crept up another 10 feet. Islands like the Seychelles, Maldives, Galapagos, and many others have gone underwater. Denmark, the Netherlands, Eastern England, Thailand, and Vietnam are only partially underwater. There's been a huge human migration these last hundred years. Fast forward about 5,000 more years, and it's the year 8113. Humanity's getting ready to open the crypt of civilization. It's a hermetically sealed room in Georgia, in the States. That Georgia. It was created in 1940, and it's full of about 800 books on microfilm, recordings of famous people's voices. It's also filled with bits of technology from that time, like a toaster, a radio, and a typewriter. Some awesome people created the crypt of civilization in case humans experienced a major catastrophe in the distant future and had to rebuild civilization from scratch. We'd all go back to using typewriters. 15,000 years from now, our planet has changed its tilt, and the Sahara Desert is now a tropical paradise. Years of rain turned the dry desert into a wild jungle. 30,000 years from now, the Voyager 1 space probe has finally left the asteroid cloud at the edge of our solar system. If it doesn't collide with anything, it'll be flying in the dark, wide-open outer space for a very long time. 50,000 years from now, the climate's changing a lot. The temperature on Earth is beginning to drop, and we are approaching the beginning of a new ice age. The radio signal with a special, hello all you aliens out there, message sent into space in 1974 has reached its destination. The message contained the human number system and data about our DNA and our solar system. If there was someone on the other end to receive this signal, we might have a response from them. 100,000 years from now, one of the largest known stars in our galaxy, Canis Majoris, explodes with enormous force. The explosion of this supernova can be seen from Earth, even during the day. And the nights are much brighter because of the new strong glow in the night sky. What's new on Earth? Super volcanoes start erupting all over. These volcanoes spew colossal amounts of lava and ash everywhere. Thick black clouds cover most of the sky. This prevents the sun's rays from reaching the ground, and the temperature on our planet drops even lower. Humans mostly live underground anyway, so it's no big deal. Because the stars are gradually moving in different directions, the usual constellations are starting to change shape. Soon, we'll need to come up with totally new constellation names. 250 years from now. Oh, a new island's on the map. Back in 2021, it was just an underwater volcano somewhere in the Pacific. After thousands of years of spouting out lava, it finally reached the ocean surface and busted out in the cool, fresh air. Not much growing on it yet. 
Niagara Falls has long since disappeared, and Lake Erie and Lake Ontario have teamed up to form one huge super lake. 300,000 years from now, the triple star system WR104 is about to explode. It's spinning crazy fast, and there's a chance that radiation from the explosion could eventually reach Earth. That would do a lot of damage to all life on our planet. Voyager 1 reaches the brightest star in the night sky, Sirius. Not a very funny star at all, it's really Sirius. It's 8.6 light years from Earth. 500,000 years from now, scientists are pretty sure that a huge meteorite could fall to Earth any day now. It might be even the size of 8 football fields. The impact of such a massive meteorite would cause an explosion so powerful that its sound would be heard on every continent. That would be followed by super strong earthquakes and tsunamis higher than the Brightside Empire Municipal Building Tower thingy. Okay, I just made that up, but who knows what we'll be building in the future. One million years from now, the rogue star Gliese 710 comes very close to our solar system. We're surrounded by a huge shield of asteroids called the Oort Cloud, and the rogue star is beginning to affect the asteroids hanging out in there. It grabs them, spins them around, and throws them toward the center of our solar system. Comets start to fall on our planet all the time, big ones, causing more tsunamis and earthquakes. 10 million years from now, the Red Sea is gradually expanding into the East African Rift. Africa is now divided in two by a new oceanic gulf. The human DNA molecule has completely decomposed. But it's no big deal. We've become totally digital, without any pesky aging problems. The really cool thing is that other animals have evolved a lot and changed ridiculously. Thanks to a simple interface, we're actually able to talk to dolphins, chimps, dogs, and cats. Turns out cats aren't grumpy, they're just busy contemplating life. 25 million years from now, the San Andreas Fault has been crazy recently and has caused the Gulf of California to flood the Central Valley. There's a new sea on the west coast of North America. 50 million years from now, Africa just collided with Eurasia. The Mediterranean Sea is totally gone. There's a new tallest mountain in the world. Its name? Mount Everest, of course. Australia is continuing its journey north. It already collided with Southeast Asia a few million years ago. The few human colonies still left on Mars need to do some serious packing. Phobos, one of Mars' moons, is beginning to orbit at a lower and lower altitude. That's not good. It's about 14 miles wide, so that's going to be unpleasant. 60 million years from now, the Canadian Rocky Mountains have completely eroded. It's just one gigantic flat plain. 80 million years from now, all the remains of Hawaii is one island. All the others have long since gone underwater. But just next door, a whole new chain of Hawaiian islands has emerged. Finally, 100 million years from now, we made it! The Atlantic shrinking down to nothing. The Americas are almost rubbing up against Africa. Africa's already merged with Eurasia. We've got ourselves a supercontinent again. Hello, Pangea Proxima. All traces of human life are gone or buried deep underground. The movement of the continents has destroyed tunnels, roads, buildings, bridges. Animals and plants now reign supreme on Earth. So, where are all the humans? Well, remember we made the jump to digital about 90 million years ago? Things are still going strong. There are trillions of human minds living on a huge hard drive on a spaceship orbiting Earth. The super low space temperature is good for keeping the drive nice and cool. We have millions of different societies, languages, and cultures just like we had 100 million years ago. The only difference? We're all little ones and zeros in a huge digital universe that we created. And yes, there's still football. Our solar system might have some more planets up its sleeve. We know about eight official planets, but they're not the only ones that survived the chaotic formation of our solar system 4.5 billion years ago. Astronomers say there are three categories of planets in our solar system. We're in the first one, the four rocky inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, that peacefully orbit the Sun. They're located within the main asteroid belt that separates Mars from Jupiter, which is in category number two. 
That one's a group of planets in the outer solar system, the gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. These planets have huge amounts of ice and gas around what scientists believe to be their rocky cores. The third group lies beyond the area where our local planets are, somewhere further than Neptune. It's the realm where you'll find dwarf planets such as Pluto, Eris, and Sedna, and many smaller space bodies like comets. But new findings say there could be something else lurking in the dark besides dwarf planets and tiny space bodies. Maybe even a new planet! Models scientists made say that our solar system used to have one or more rocky planets the size of Mars or Earth. Over time, these rocky wanderers interacted with the wide gravity fields of our gas giants. This kicked them into a far out orbit, away from the neighborhood. The question is, if one of those Mars-sized planets survived and could really be somewhere out there. Scientists have made simulations to see what potentially happened. These showed that in half of such cases where planets interact with the gravity of gas giants, they get ejected into interstellar space. In the remaining half, there's this one rogue planet left in an orbit similar to the ones the Kuiper Belt objects are following. There's only one thing left to do now. Find it. Astronomers found the loneliest planet in the universe. They were trying to find distant brown dwarf stars, or failed stars, ones that never become massive enough to start shining. Stars are born with big masses, which means they also have strong self-gravity. The star squeezes in on itself. That causes high internal temperatures and enables the star to shine. But instead, they found a lonely wanderer, CFBD SIR 2149. The planet is between 50 and 120 million years old and has a surface temperature of 750 degrees Fahrenheit. Compared to stars, that's cold. At first, scientists thought it could be a brown dwarf star, but in that case, it would be way older. This starless planet floats around through space, passing only 130 light years away from our planet. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, is 100,000 light years wide, so that's relatively close. The lonely traveler is actually a gas giant, four to seven times bigger than Jupiter. Maybe it was kicked out from its own solar system because of gravitational forces, or getting into another planet's orbit, or it was formed away from its parent star. Far beyond Pluto, on the edge of our solar system, there's a space body about as big as Pluto, but a little bit colder and way denser. It's probably a big rocky body covered in a thin icy mantle. It's the dwarf planet Eris. Both Pluto and Eris occupy the Kuiper Belt, which is the distant ring of frigid space bodies that lies beyond Neptune. A day there lasts 25.9 hours, pretty similar to Earth. But Eris circles our sun in the distance three times farther than Pluto, which means its year is pretty long, 557 Earth years. Eris has a bright, icy surface. It's one of the most reflective bodies in our solar system. It bounces back more than 95% of the light that strikes it. Somewhere out there, even farther, there's a super Saturn, J1407b, much larger than Jupiter or Saturn. It's an exoplanet, which means a planet that orbits a star other than our Sun. Super Saturn is 434 light years away from Earth in the constellation of Centaurus. It's the only exoplanet we know about with rings similar to Saturn. It actually has a huge ring system, 200 times bigger than Saturn's rings. There are more than 30 rings, each of them tens of millions of miles in diameter. There are gaps in the rings, which means there could be some interesting satellites, exomoons, around. If this super Saturn could swap places with our regular Saturn, its rings would absolutely dominate our sky. You could look up and easily see them. The view would be amazing because they would appear much bigger than a full moon. Scientists have found thousands of planets outside of our solar system. Some are dense as iron, while others are airy and light. And then there's the water world, GJ1214b, a steamy world, bigger than Earth and smaller than Uranus, 40 light years away from us in the constellation of Ophiuchus. It's a watery planet surrounded by a thick atmosphere, 2.7 times Earth's diameter and almost seven times heavier than our home planet. It was most likely formed somewhere farther from its star, where there was plenty of water ice, 
but later migrated to where it is today. Its surface temperature is 440 degrees Fahrenheit, which is too hot to host life like on Earth. It also has much less rock and much more water than our planet. Imagine a planet with no land, but only endless oceans covering all of its surface. High pressures and temperatures would form things like superfluid water or hot ice, some pretty exotic materials that we can't see on our planet. Gliese 436b. It's a Neptune-sized exoplanet 30 light-years away from our planet in the constellation of Leo. It makes one full orbit around its star in a little more than two days. This planet defies the laws of physics. It orbits its star, Gliese 436, which is smaller, cooler, and less luminous than our Sun, at a distance 15 times closer than Mercury is to the Sun. When we typically think of ice, we picture a frozen cube. But this planet has an icy surface, even though the temperature there is 980 degrees Fahrenheit. This temperature is way above the melting point, but the ice remains solid and burning hot. This happens because of very strong gravity. It compresses the water vapor in the atmosphere into solid ice. The pressure here doesn't allow the ice to melt, no matter how hot the surface is. Now imagine being on a mysterious planet and it suddenly starts raining sapphires and rubies. One distant exoplanet, Hat P7b, a gas giant 1,000 light years away from Earth in the constellation of Cygnus and 16 times bigger, has specific weather and pretty violent storms. Rubies and sapphires are scattered across the planet when it's raining. On the planet's night side, there's a high amount of corundum in the atmosphere. And corundum is what mineral gems such as sapphires and rubies are made of. Clouds of corundum give such an amazing view. The planet is plagued by severe winds that often turn into powerful storms that push huge masses of those clouds across the planet. Although the planet is uninhabitable, it would certainly be cool to come there and pick up some gems. Still, the weather is pretty wild. Plus, the temperatures are over 4,600 degrees Fahrenheit. By comparison, Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system, and its temperature is only 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Looking over the expanse of space, you can see a beautiful little blue dot in the endless darkness. It's an exoplanet, HD 189733b, that lies 63 light years from us in the constellation of Volpecula. But it's way hotter and larger than our planet, around the size of Jupiter and it completes its orbit around its host star in only 2.2 Earth days. That orbit is so close that the planet is most likely tidally locked. That means it's always showing only one face to its star, like our moon always shows one side to Earth. The weather here is crazy. The winds blow at up to 5,400 miles per hour, which is seven times the speed of sound. The fastest wind on Earth only hit the mark of 230 miles per hour. And it gets better. The rain here is not made of water, but of molten glass. Clouds are made of silicate atoms and particles. They are the key element that gives the planet its cobalt blue color, not the reflection of oceans, which is the case with Earth. Earth used to be purple. Today, even when you look at our planet from space, you see a lot of green. The green we see in nature is there because of photosynthesis, the process where plants transform energy coming from the sun into energy they need to live and to produce oxygen for us. The main part of the process that gives plants the green color is the chlorophyll pigment. A long time ago, instead of chlorophyll, there was a molecule called retinol. Its pigments absorb yellow and green light and turn it into red and blue. So the earth was more purple. And then there's a pink planet, GJ504b, far away from us in the Virgo constellation, four times more massive than Jupiter. It's a newly formed exoplanet, around 160 million years old. By comparison, the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. If we could go there, we would see an incredible world that glows from the heat of its formation. Everything around you would be colored magenta. 15,000 years after the construction of the first space colony, planet Kepler 452b. 1400 light years from old Earth. Hello, first year students. We're glad to welcome you to the Intergalactic University. Endless space is now home for us humans, but thousands of years ago, we used to live on just one planet we now call old Earth. Yes, I understand it's difficult to believe. Today, 
it's one huge nature reserve. Mammoths and stegosaurs walk on its surface, and pterodactyls fly in its skies. It turned out to be easier to recreate animals that roamed it millions of years ago than to understand how our ancestors lived. The Great Cataclysm made them abandon the planet in a hurry, leaving much of its legacy behind. And now, we're studying it anew. But our excavations leave more questions than answers. Skyscrapers, highways, shopping centers, coffee shops – everything is buried under sand and soil. Rust has eaten away the metal, and time turns concrete into dust. Even the Hoover Dam and the Three Gorges Dam in China have crumbled. The colossal structures turned into heaps of stones. The remaining buildings have become overgrown with plants and turned into a home for millions of living creatures. But there's good news as well. Faces carved into Mount Rushmore are still visible. The mountain is granite, and this rock is one of the hardest on old Earth. For over 15,000 years, the faces of U.S. presidents have deteriorated by only two inches. The monument will stand for millions of years. And the latest expedition to the Sahara Desert managed to dig out the Great Pyramid from the sand. Now any tourist can buy a ticket and look at that wonder which even Earthlings considered very old. Surprisingly, ruins and crumbling walls of medieval castles in Europe have survived. They're built of massive stones and without metal fittings, which expand and destroy the stone when rusting. Our ancestors left behind a huge amount of garbage. Empty bottles, plastic packaging, wrappers – all this helps scientists to recreate the consumption patterns of people of the past. Thanks to this, we know for sure that in the 2000s, almost 8 billion people ate mostly chips, chocolate bars, and pizza. And they rarely drank ordinary water. They loved coffee, though. 60% of Earthlings lived on the internet for 7 hours a day. 2 billion websites worked 24-7. At first, information was stored on hard disks, flash drives, and compact disks. But this kind of storage went obsolete after a couple of years. The cloud took their place. It was an online storage with servers connected to the global network. They recorded the entire life of Earth's civilization and were stored in data centers. In space, the Earth's internet didn't work well. Apparently, huge distances and lack of technical knowledge did their job. Imagine that a Pluto resident wants to know the difference between margarita and calzone pizzas. They click the link and wait for a couple of hours for it to open. If the dough's already in the oven, no good. Each colony organized its own internet by sending satellites to orbit their planets. It took time to connect thousands of colonies into the intergalactic web we now know as Uninet. When the cataclysm struck, People had to escape, leaving their planet to its fate. Electricity went out, no one maintained the servers and data centers, and lots of info about their civilization was lost. We've scanned miles deep into the Earth and found many interesting artifacts. Students, I invite you to look at this amazing thing. The Earthlings called it a camera. People took pictures of their food, morning runs, and new shoes on it. One thing our scientists couldn't comprehend, though, is that ancient people used to communicate with its help, too. One of the main mysteries of the past are the dishes of different sizes. Archaeologists find them in almost every home. They bear these names – Buddy, Cosmo, Rex, Princess. We know these were the things from which dogs and cats ate, but we don't know why people pampered these animals so much. For example, Archaeologists recently unearthed a beauty salon for poodles in San Francisco. I also love my dragon from the jungles of Galisa 832C, but I don't perm its fur and manicure its claws. And this is my favorite artifact, a book. There's nothing more valuable in the universe. There's only one sample in my antiques collection. It's a cooking recipes anthology. I paid a fortune for it. The ruins of museums are treasures for archaeologists and all the new humanity. These buildings collapsed a long time ago and now look like ordinary hills, overgrown with trees and grass. 
Museums are like pearls in the ocean. They lie at the bottom and wait to be fished from their shells. And sometimes, archaeologists manage that. Books, paintings, documents, and clothes have mostly turned to dust. But we can enjoy the statues that were carved out of marble by masters of ancient Greece and Rome. On the walls of caves around the world, there are drawings of animals and handprints of the first people. They didn't know how to read, drive a car, or fly a spaceship. But their paintings have survived. It's incredible. Over thousands of years, time has eaten up huge dams, cities with skyscrapers and bridges, and the palm of an ancient human still adorns the cold and rough wall of a cave. Space archaeology is becoming more and more popular. Thousands of tons of space debris fly around old Earth. The real sensation is the discovery of the Voyager 1 probe. Earthlings sent it into space at the very beginning of their development. I see your condescending smiles. Today, such a device can be assembled by any first-year student from spare parts in their parents' garage. But, dear students, let's not laugh at our ancestors. They tried their best. Voyager isn't a simple satellite. The device can be compared to a message in a bottle thrown into the sea. And the cosmic sea is millions of times larger than the Pacific Ocean of old Earth. Engineers of the past left a time capsule with a message in the probe. It contains photographs of people and the nature of the planet, as well as scientific information about the Earth. 90 minutes of recorded music are of particular interest. This is a real gift from our ancestors to us, to the people of space. Radio signals that humankind sent into space have also survived. We've tracked them. Radio broadcasts, phone conversations, even music charts continue their journey through space. Millions of years later, they'll weaken and leave behind only an electromagnetic echo. In 2020, there were 1.4 billion cars on old Earth. Unbelievable! But they moved along asphalted roads on rubber tires, not in the air. When humans flew into space, they left their vehicles on the planet. Within just a couple hundred years, the cars went completely bust and turned into piles of metal, plastic, and rubber. One that survived for millennia was the lunar roving vehicle. There's no air, no water, and no earthquakes on the moon. Anything that comes here becomes kind of suspended in time, and that's what happened to the rover. Archaeologists have found a lot of other whole and crashed spacecraft on the moon. These devices are priceless artifacts in the Museum of Primitive Earth Technology. In the Svalbard Archipelago in the Arctic Ocean, scientists have unearthed the Global Seed Vault. Earthlings built it in 2008. It became a real sensation. The huge silo contained 4.5 million samples of 500 seeds each. Billions of seeds have helped provide agriculture for the colonies. Now you can eat popcorn and hamburgers with real bread rolls thanks to those. For thousands of years, the seeds were kept without human attention. This isn't a miracle, but an accurate scientific calculation. The vault is built underground at a depth of 390 feet. There are no earthquakes or floods there, and the permafrost provided the optimum temperature for the seeds to survive. Most metals are mined from ore. These ores don't contain pure metals, but only their chemical compounds. To get pure iron, the ore must be smelted first. But there's a problem. Metals from ore oxidize on contact with water or oxygen. Simply put, they rust. This is how metal returns to its natural ore state. That's why nails, metal fences, bridges, and houses rust and collapse. But this doesn't happen with gold, silver, and platinum. Things made from these metals are eternal and will never lose their shape. Of course, if you don't start hitting the rings and pennants with a hammer. During excavations, archaeologists find thousands of jewelry items. Earthlings love to wear them on their bodies. Crowns, luxurious necklaces, wedding rings. All this jewelry is now history kept in galactic museums. The year was 536. Changes happened fast, literally overnight. 
people began to wonder if it was indeed the end of the world as they knew it. They soon noticed that their silhouettes didn't cast any shadows, even at noon. The sun was becoming weirder by the day, turning bluish in color. The moon had lost its shine altogether. Soon enough, it already looked as if the seasons were all mixed together in one single day. Frost and snow started to appear in the middle of summer. The ocean seemed to become angrier too, with currents moving at unseen speeds. At one point, the sun was only shining for about four hours a day, and it had lost most of its power. The rain stopped falling altogether, and the temperatures dropped lower than ever before. If you look at historical writings from back then, it's easy to see why people lost all hope. Since there was no sun and no rain, crops were badly affected. There was not much food going around for people or animals. Territories that now belong to Italy or Ireland, to Japan and Central America were all affected by what would become a decade-long thick fog that shifted the planet's temperature. The human population decreased by about 100 million, while those that survived seemed to have lost their sense of purpose. So soon enough, cities collapsed. It's for good reason that the year 536 is considered by a lot of historians to be the worst time to be alive. It took scientists years to figure out this mysterious period in our history and what might have caused such a shift in the global climate. But with the help of an ultra-precise analysis of ice from a Swiss glacier, we might finally have the answer. The team behind the research figured out that the culprit was a volcanic eruption that began in Iceland. The result was a large amount of volcanic ash getting transported all over the Northern Hemisphere at the beginning of 536. This event was followed by two other similar eruptions, one in 540 and the other in 547. If that wasn't unlucky enough, the world would soon be overwhelmed with disease, which disrupted the world's economy. It took humankind until 640 to bounce back to normalcy. Even though we have this piece of the puzzle in place, how can a volcanic eruption on a small island cause so much damage? It turns out that when a volcano erupts, large amounts of sulfur, bismuth, and other damaging substances get mixed in the atmosphere. The larger the eruption, the more substances get sprayed into the protective gas layer. All these elements create an aerosol veil, which acts like a mirror. It reflects sunlight back into space. As a result, the whole planet gets darker and colder. And if we look at the data, it makes a lot of sense. Almost every unusually cold summer we've had over the past 2,500 years happened after a volcanic eruption. Back in the 6th century, these eruptions occurred really fast, one after another, which could also explain why the whole period lasted 18 months. This wasn't the only year that baffled scientists when it came to Earth's climate. The year 1816, for example, was also dubbed the year without a summer. Mount Tambora in Indonesia is probably to blame for this one since it erupted in 1815. This event was the largest of its kind in 10,000 years. As a result, the global average temperature ranged by almost 2 degrees Fahrenheit. Globally, a lot of events happened. Although, at the time, they seemed isolated. In New England, for example, because of the cooler temperatures, crops failed, so a lot of farmers had to move to the west. The demographic of the country remained reshaped forever. In continental Europe, the potato harvest was lost almost in its entirety, resulting in some of the worst periods of famine people had ever experienced there. Humankind aside, what could really be considered the worst day on Earth? Scientists have come up with this candidate almost unanimously. The worst day in our planet's history happened almost exactly 66 million years ago. It was when an asteroid about the size of Manhattan broke through the Earth's atmosphere and landed on the Yucatan Peninsula. People believed it happened somewhere in June or July. This space traveler created a 20-mile-wide hole in our planet's surface. Chunks of soil and rock were displaced, some even making it halfway to the moon. They didn't stay up there, though. Some came back at an astonishing speed, having been turned into spheres of molten glass. 
They lit up forests and large areas of land until fires were raging everywhere. Some got stuck in outer space and eventually blocked the sun's rays, cooling the planet altogether. What followed immediately were multiple powerful earthquakes and damaging tsunamis sweeping across the Gulf of Mexico. By the time our planet regained some form of normalcy, 75% of all species on Earth had vanished. The most famous of all, dinosaurs. This asteroid theory was first proposed in 1980, but it's still up for debate in the scientific community. None of our planet's other large-scale extinctions were triggered by an asteroid impact. What made this one so special was that it caused dinosaurs to disappear altogether, even the most resilient. Leave it to passionate scientists to come up with another interesting story. The impact might have altered the chemical composition of Earth's oceans. The seawater might have become acidic, and tiny plankton that sit at the base of the marine food chain could have disappeared for a while. What followed might have been a series of species vanishing in a domino effect. Top that with other events that followed the asteroid impact, like the lack of sunlight and the overall cooling down of our planet. Now it's easy to see why this really might have been the worst day in our planet's history. But Earth is millions of years old, and not all of them were that bad. Let's travel back to ancient Egypt, which was way ahead of its time when it came to technology, science, medicine, and architecture. A lot of people had access to education and medical care. They had an opportunity to do sports and take up other leisure activities. A lot of things that are familiar to us these days and that we consider to be quite modern were available for ancient Egyptians. Pens, breath mints, toothpaste, board games, and even makeup. Others say Athens in the 4th to 5th century BCE was quite a nice time too. People there had equal rights, no matter what their social or educational level was. And speaking of wealth, it was also distributed between people pretty equally. If you had lived in those days and liked wandering through the city, you might have stumbled upon Aristotle, Plato, and Hippocrates. Their ideas became the base of what we now know as Western civilization. Theater, literature, and architecture also flourished during that time. Italy during the Renaissance period was also pretty nice. That's when the country saw an economic, cultural, and artistic transformation following a gruesome period of famine and disease. Workers now had the ability to ask for better working conditions and higher wages. The economy was flourishing too, which allowed arts and culture to expand. Wealthy members of Italian society had enough funds to become patrons for artists, writers, architects, and scientists. Now let's take 1804. It was the year we got introduced to the modern railway, and our ways of transportation were changed forever. It was the year when Englishman Richard Trevithick came up with the first practical steam locomotive. It was the first time when a large number of passengers were transported over a really long distance. And how about the year 1876? That's when the telephone was invented. Can you imagine a life without your cell phone today? It was Alexander Graham Bell that patented the first phone in the 19th century. As for the cell phone, it was Martin Cooper, an engineer from Motorola, who came up with the first handheld phone. As much as we all wait for summer, this season is going crazy. I mean, a typical summer in Death Valley can be as hot as 130 degrees Fahrenheit. But you know what? The year 1816 was a total bummer. Guess why? Because that year, there was literally no summer at all. Seriously, where was all the warmth and sunshine in Europe and North America? Well, turns out the answer lies on the other side of the world, at Mount Tambora in Indonesia. Now picture this. On April 5, 1815, Mount Tambora, a mighty volcano far away in Bali, started making some serious noise. And boy, did it explode. It was the biggest volcanic eruption ever recorded in history. The eruption was so intense that it spewed tons of ash and aerosols into the atmosphere, blocking out the sun and turning the sky into a gloomy mess. The ash even fell on nearby towns, burying them under layers of ash. There were reports of several feet of ash floating on the ocean surface. Imagine sailing through that mess. But here's where it gets really crazy. 
those tiny particles of ash and aerosols were light enough to travel through the atmosphere for months. They made their way into the stratosphere, spreading all over the world. Do you see what I'm driving at? They caused the Earth's average temperature to drop nearly 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Thankfully, it was only temporary, and eventually, even the smallest particles fell out of the atmosphere, allowing the sunshine to return. If you imagine the year without a summer as a year when you have to wear a down jacket even in July, you're right. If you could only pick three words to describe that summer, these would be cold, gloomy, and dark. That summer of 1816, it was snowing in New England. Western Europe had cold rain nonstop. It was a total climate roller coaster with temperatures. Europe was hit the hardest, with summer temperatures reaching record breaking lows. We're talking about the coldest summer in over 200 years. Now, let's take a look at the year without summer's impact on Europe and North America. It was a disaster. A ton of serious problems happened all across the Northern Hemisphere. Crops were wiped out by frost or lack of sunlight, leaving people hungry and desperate. Farmers who managed to grow crops were terrified of being robbed because food became so valuable. And get this, with the scarcity of oats, which became super expensive, it cost a fortune to feed horses. Guess what that means? Travel became ridiculously expensive since horses were the main mode of transportation back then. But hey, maybe this crazy situation inspired a dude named Carl Dre to invent the bicycle. Who needs a horse when you can pedal your way around, right? This is how it happened. Carl was like, hmm, maybe there's a better way to get around without relying on animals. Let's use some good old human power. And that's how the Laufmaschine, uh, pardon my German, the bicycle was born. Fast forward a year, Carl decided to take his Laufmaschine for its first ride in Mannheim. This thing was known as the Dreising, Velocipede, or Dandy Horse in England. It was basically the OG version of bicycles and motorbikes, using the two-wheel principle. This machine weighed about 48 pounds, had wheels with brass ball bearings covered in iron, and was mostly made out of wood. No pedals, but it was still steerable and had a rear wheel brake. It even had a short tail in front to keep it balanced. On June 12, 1817, Carl hopped in his Lausch machine and rode from Mannheim to a coaching inn, which was about 8 miles away. He did it in under an hour. Not bad for a wooden bike without pedals, huh? The year without a summer also had a big impact on the settling of the American heartland. A ton of people, especially those poor farm families who got wiped out by the disaster, said peace out to New England and headed to western New York and the Northwest Territory. They were on the hunt for a better climate, richer soil, and just overall better conditions for growing stuff. Indiana became a state in 1816, followed by Illinois two years later. Plus, Vermont took a major hit in population during this time. Like we're talking about a decrease of 10,000 to 15,000 people. It's like erasing seven whole years of population growth. Now, to borrow a bicycle analogy, let's switch gears for a sec. In June 1860, it rained like crazy during the summer. So these famous peeps like Mary Shelley, Percy Bysshe Shelley, Lord Byron, and John William Polidori were stuck inside the Villa Diodati in Switzerland. They were on vacation, but Mother Nature was not cooperating. So they decided to have a little contest to see who could write the scariest story. Mary Shelley ended up writing Frankenstein, which we all know is a classic. And Lord Byron wrote this thing called A Fragment, which Polidori later used as the inspiration for The Vampire, which was like a prequel to Dracula. Can you imagine being stuck inside with these literary geniuses? Anyway, those days at Villa Diodati were pretty intense. They were filled with tension and deep conversations about life and stuff. Mary Shelley even had a dream about Frankenstein while she was there, and that's how her famous story began. Oh, and Lord Byron got inspired to write a poem called Darkness, because one day it got so dark that the birds went to bed early and they had to light candles like it was midnight. The poem is all about the year without a summer, so it's like he turned the crazy weather into art. So, after Mount Tambora blew its top, the atmosphere was all filled up with tephra, creating this hazy sky that stuck around for a few years. And you know what? 
those sunsets were absolutely stunning, with rich red hues that you would only see after a volcanic eruption. Paintings from that time totally back it up, too. They show that these vibrant reds weren't around before the eruption. But that's not all. The paintings also got all moody and dark, even when the sun and moon were shining. It's like everyone's mood took a turn for the worse. Instead of happy and carefree afternoons, the themes shifted to religion, industry, and just a hint of despair. The artists were all about capturing reality. So these paintings were like snapshots of life before and after the eruption. Take Caspar David Friedrich's works, for example. His pieces like The Monk by the Sea and Two Men by the Sea really show this change in mood. Right, if there was a year without summer, there must have been at least one year without winter. Yep, the winter of 1877-78 in the twin cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota was like no other. They even called it the year without a winter. It was the warmest winter on record, with an average temperature of 29 degrees Fahrenheit from December to February. Now, you might think that the people living there back then were loving this warm weather, right? Well, not exactly. See, back in those days, they relied heavily on horses and sleigh for travel. But with the lack of snow and dirt roads, it made getting around a real pain in the you-know-what. Businesses were also affected because they couldn't move their goods easily. Despite the overall warmth, there were a few freezing days in early January 1878 that froze the mighty Mississippi River in St. Paul. It was closed for navigation until the end of February. Only three days for the rest of the cool season had single-digit temperatures or lower. The warmth didn't stop there. Even March 1878 was unusually warm. The first boat arrived in Duluth, Minnesota on March 17th, which was way earlier than usual. And lakes like Minnetonka and Osakis lost their ice way ahead of schedule too. It was like spring came knocking on their doors super early. It may seem that all this warmth meant it was a dry winter, but nope. From December 1877 to February 1878, they actually had over 3 inches of precipitation. That's more than the average for that time. Mother Nature sure knows how to keep us on our toes. It's a snowy winter night. You're inside your cozy house and watching a historical movie that takes place during the Middle Ages. As you take another sip of your hot chocolate, you can't help but wonder how the people survived the winter back then. At that exact moment, your TV screen suddenly turns into a portal and pulls you inside! Oh! You open your eyes to find yourself within the world of the movie you were just watching. A man approaches you and says, Welcome to my medieval village. I am Bartholomew, and I called you here to give you an answer to your question. First of all, let me tell you that conditions became extremely harsh when the cold arrives, and not just for the northern countries. Mainland Europe takes its share of the brutal weather too. So winter is kind of a slowing down time for all of us. You see, we usually associate winter with old age and poverty because of all the changes that occur in nature during this time. For example, we can't really grow any crops when snow covers all our land. And by the early 14th century, things started to get even worse because we started seeing the first signs of what you may know as the Little Ice Age. Cold temperatures peaked. Weather anomalies and extreme events such as sudden floods or hailstorms started to occur, which added to our agony. Take the winter of 1359, for instance. Across central Italy, the snow rose to extraordinary heights. People had to throw the snow into the streets to lighten up their roofs. And because of that, some towns were completely blocked. Their inhabitants were trapped in their homes for several days. Another example of this is the winter of 1389. The snowfall was so great in the Luzerne region of France that many people's farmsteads and houses were destroyed. Bartholomew notices that you start shivering. Ah, you were not prepared for this journey back to medieval winters, I see. 
Let's walk to my home and find you some warmer clothes. As you can see, I'm already wearing a cloak, a scarf, and mittens, which are all made out of wool. I also have boots that are made out of leather from a deer. Still, all these are not really enough to stay warm when one is outside. That's why we usually layer other clothes underneath them all to keep the warmth trapped. By the way, the wool can get heavy and itchy sometimes. So beneath our woolen outer clothing, we wear linen undergarments too. The linen acts as a barrier between the wool and the skin, therefore making things a bit more comfortable for us. It is also easier to wash linen clothes, and they dry way faster than woolen ones. The wealthier ones can line their winter clothing with fur. And us regular peasants sometimes use rabbit and lamb for the same purpose. It's not as glamorous, but still effective. We can also hunt some wild animals and birds with the permission of the Lord. Yet again, the sumptuary laws, in other words, consumption laws, are very clear on who can wear what according to their social standing. Take the 1363 English sumptuary law, for example. It states that the wives and daughters of craftspeople and land-owning peasants were only allowed to wear lamb, rabbit, cat, and fox furs. You notice a weird-looking hinged metal sphere in Bartholomew's pocket, and ask him what that is. Ah, it's a hand warmer, he says, as he gives it to you. If we are going to be outdoors for a long time, we bring one of these with us. Otherwise, one's fingers can get numb, you know. Now take a closer look at it, and you'll see that it has tiny holes on its surface. This helps the heat to escape, so that we can warm our hands without burning them once we fill it with hot coal. That's kind of heavy, you say, and think about how lucky you are to be living in modern times. With just one click from the comfort of your home, you can order Hot Hands Instant Hand Warmers from Amazon, and no coal is necessary. You can even put those inside your shoes to warm your toes, since they're pocket-sized, unlike this metal orb. You and Bartholomew arrive at his house. You realize that he does not take any of his outer garments off. We keep everything on during the coldest months, because the indoor heating isn't always great, he says. As you can see, the fireplace stands here at the center of our homes, and right above it, there is a ventilation hole, rather than a chimney, which causes us to lose so much of the heat. Yet again, we don't usually sleep in our outside clothes. Instead, we put bricks and stones in the fire, wrap them in fabric, and take them to our beds to warm the sheets. Wearing our nightcaps all night long also helps. And when we're not sleeping, we usually try to stay close to the fireplace as much as possible. You sure appreciate that hot water bottle of yours more now, right? And you didn't even need to cover it with a cloth, like these folks have to do. It already came with a knit cover for your convenience. And the best part is, it's much softer than a brick, and can be heated in the microwave within seconds. How rude of me! I forgot to offer you something to eat, Bartholomew says. I know I already told you winter means stillness for us, but we still need to put in some work to not starve. There's a lot of preparation to be done in advance to survive these medieval winters. First of all, we start gathering wood for the fire from as early as spring and through the summer. Then there's the food we harvest in the fall. We have to preserve that in a special way, so all will last over the winter months. The same thing goes for meat, too. The methods we use include pickling, drying, and brining. In terms of grains, cereals, and pulses, we dry them out and store them in ceramic or clay pots. We later use them for making potted stews and soups, in addition to vegetables. Basically, everything we can find goes into the pot. The most common foods we eat in our everyday lives include onions, peas, beans, lentils, and herbs such as parsley. 
We still have to include protein in our diet, though. And we do that by eating cheese, eggs, fatty bacon, or salted pork. In terms of fresh fruits and berries, they are hard to find during wintertime, so we preserve the ones we already picked by the air-drying method, too. You think to yourself, if only these people had a food dryer at home, their lives would be so much easier. They could use it for all the foods Bartholomew just mentioned, from fruits to meat. Then again, there's no electricity here. I wouldn't want you to think winters are so grim, long, and boring after everything I've told you. We still do plenty of activities to keep ourselves entertained, Bartholomew says. But what? It's not like they can binge watch their favorite TV shows. We play in the snow a lot, adults and children all together. You can see plenty of peasants ice skating on the frozen lakes. To be able to do that, we used to use pieces of polished wood or horse shin bones. But now, we have iron skates too. I need to mention though, here in Western Europe, ice skating is not as common as in Scandinavia. That is because they are more accustomed to snow and cold temperatures. Sledding is another fun activity we do. Then there are indoor games, such as chess, backgammon, and other dice games. Wool spinning and telling stories are also common ways to spend some nice time with our family. Not surprisingly, nobles have more opportunities in the entertainment area too. For example, boar hunting is very common amongst the elite. At that moment, a portal appears at the door. Bartholomew says, Guess it's time for you to head back, traveler. Fare thee well.